morning, and welcome to Windows on the World. I'm Mark Hallen, Director of Theater here at Eastern. It's all about the ancestors. In the beginning, there was an empty theater space at Wheaton College in 1988. And Wheaton College and People's Light and Theater Company, just down the road here, begat something called Muse, which begat Eastern Summer Theater Camp, which begat Yes And, which begat the winter sort of thing, which begets all of us here now today. I was teaching at Wheaton when a, another alum from Wheaton Theater uh, had just come back from an internship at People's Light here. And she proposed using the theater at Wheaton to run a, what she called, collaborative arts education program, using the model she had learned at People's Light. It involved improvisational, interdisciplinary, myth-based theater making in which adult artist teachers invite kids into the creative process with a promise. If you can imagine it, we'll make it together. It was called Muse. So with the blessing of Jim Young, Wheaton's director of theater, and the financial support of the college, Muse fledged for two years at Wheaton, working at first with local suburban kids, kids of faculty and staff, nine to 14 years old, before eventually moving eastward, first to inner city Indianapolis, and then the Badlands, as it was called in those days, of North Philadelphia. Uh, it was actually sponsored there, Muse was sponsored there by the uh, Norris Square Neighborhood Project, which was co-founded, as it turns out, by our own Helen Loeb, for whom our School of Education is named. Muse also landed, at the same time, in Camden at a little joint called Urban Promise, which Tony Campolo had founded. Muse ran in the Philadelphia area for six years, by which time we had attracted a variety of funders, including the Pew Charitable Trusts, which named Muse one of the top 10 model arts education companies in the area, along with the Police Touch Museum and others. By that time, I was directing and teaching here at Eastern, using the model of theater training and making I'd learned at Wheaton. <clears throat> and in the spring of 1998, a group of theater students, including members of the newly founded Simple Way, asked me if I knew a way to make theater with kids in the empty theater space here during the summer. And indeed, I did. And the funders who had supported Muse were also eager to see the model return under the auspices of Eastern. So Eastern Summer Theater Camp was born that summer, bringing together children from the city, the Berry School, Cornerstone Academy, as well as Germantown, and the suburbs. By then, each summer camp production also became a musical, thus combining instruction in dance, acting, writing, and visual art with music making. Dr. Black, then the newly installed president of Eastern, blessed the endeavor, providing space and vans and many other kinds of resources, and continued to support it through 2004 when Yes And was born, founded by the students who originated the program here at Eastern. Brooke Sexton, Jake Miller, Sarah Butzmanzo, Michael Bricks, and others. So supported by EAPE and other organizations and foundations, Yes And took off, providing up to seven theater camps a summer, as well as after school and literacy programs. Between Eastern Summer Theater Camp and Yes And, in 15 years, well over 1,000 young people have been served in 60 different programs in neighborhoods all over the Philadelphia area. In fact, also Yes And's shadow company, their high school group, directed by our speaker today, Michael Bricks, is a regular at the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. So, from Wheaton to Muse to Eastern to Yes And to the winter sort of thing. Begun in 2008, inspired by then Dean Betsy Morgan, now Yes And's co-president of the board, the Winter Sort of Thing has produced six family musical theater productions involving dozens of alum and current students and many, many kids, while becoming the flagship production of Eastern Theater, combining Eastern's mission of faith, reason, and justice with creativity and community in a way nothing else we do 
does. Along the way, we've also enrolled three Yes and Kids as students here at Eastern, among which Derek Gregory and Tanisha Coleman. So 25 years later, after all that begetting, we're all here, including our speaker today, the executive director of Yes and, Michael Bricks. That was great. All right, so um, that's all I need to say. Mark, <laughs> Mark said it all. Good morning. Uh, I want to uh, start off by thanking Nancy uh, Hartsock and Ken Sparks, the Eastern University Community, Eastern University Theater, of course, and Dr. David Black in particular for having me here today. I'd like to say, maybe because I have this forum right now, how lucky that we have been as a community, us, Eastern community, to have been led so faithfully by a man as great as our Dr. David Black, and we wish him well in his retirement. I want to thank you, Mark, also for those kind words. Thank you for your mentorship, your care to me and to all of us over well over a decade now. We strive to be a reflection of your ideals, to pay forward what we have learned. As students, there's not much more we can do, and we hope it's enough. Many of you just heard that I was part of the founding of a, a very small, very earnest group of young people who started The Simple Way in 1999. For those of you unfamiliar with The Simple Way, we were a group of people with enough faith to try living together and reaching out to our neighbors. Well then, one of us started speaking to large groups, and it wasn't me. <laughs> My friend Shane, would be asked to these rallies and to these youth gatherings. And I, I always thought, man, I can do that. It looked easy enough, and I, I never worried about talking in front of a group. The words, you know, they just came to me. You know, it's like a filling of the spirit. And I had an opportunity, uh, you know, through the simple way, to speak at this, uh, this large youth gathering uh, down south somewhere. I don't remember. And uh, it, this place, I was, I was going to be the, the lead-in speaker uh, at this youth gathering there, th that they had this uh, uh, very popular at the time Christian band that was going to follow up and they were going to rock and roll those kids to Jesus. And the night before, the night before that, I was so sure that I would know what I was going to say. So I joined my friends and we watched a movie. I think it was Black Hawk Down. When I got in front of what seemed to be the thousands of kids the next day, I suddenly realized I had nothing to say to them. This was harder than it looked. It was much harder. I looked down at my notes, and there was not much looking back up at me. I'm almost positive that I gave the shortest motivational speech ever. And thank God that YouTube wasn't around back then. Please don't worry. I do have something to say today, and I even wrote it down. So we'll be good. My friend. Tony Campolo. I call him my friend, even though he mostly forgets my name when I see him. <laughs> it's true, if you know Tony. He's fond of saying, and I'm going to paraphrase him here, that children at play are the closest thing here on earth to the kingdom of heaven. And I know this isn't a totally perfect mathematical equation because I have two boys. And if Tony's right, sometimes heaven sounds like two cats stuffed in a pillowcase with only one emerging, and even then, not in one piece. But if you can, think with me for a minute of uh, the child's game of tag. Try to remember exactly what it was like when you were running away at full speed from that person who was it. It's likely that you weren't thinking about their popularity or your popularity. You weren't thinking about what they were wearing. You weren't thinking about the size of their bank account, you know? None of that mattered. You didn't give thought to those things, but the most exhilarating moment wasn't when you were hiding behind the big kid hoping that she didn't see you. The pinnacle of the game was when the it was bearing down right behind you and you were just, just out of her reach. Is there a more joyful, a more truthful moment in all of life? I give you that that moment that moment was what Tony was talking about when he said that it was close to heaven. 
The question is, how do we release ourselves to those moments, even now as adults? And what on earth does this have to do with art making or with Trayvon Martin? Hold on, I'm gonna get there. But first, I have to tell you a little more about what we do at Yes and Collaborative Arts. And before then, we're gonna have to do a little vocabulary lesson. So this is gonna probably be a little more of an interactive uh, windows on the world than you're used to. When I talk about art, when I talk about artists, what I'm mostly referring to is you. I believe that we're all artists. Wasn't it Picasso that said that every child is born an artist? and the problem is to remain one once they grow up. Just like every child is born like an athlete. I mean, have you ever thought about like how hard it is to learn to walk? And every child is born exploring and creating. There was one time I was uh, at a friend's house and they had two young kids and these kids were making everything cookies. You know, they were in the kitchen and really, you know, really what they were making was a mess. But I mean, it was literally everything edible that they could find, they put together in a bowl, made it into a cookie shape and shoved it in the, you know, in the oven for a little bit. Those cookies were not good, <laughs> but they were awesome. So when I talk about artists, you can just assume that I'm talking about you. I recognize that many of you probably have no idea why we're even called Yes And. I could explain it to you, but it would take way too long and we have a show coming up in, uh, in an hour or so. But our name is really special to us. I mean, why else would we call ourselves something that is really hard to pronounce on the phone, you know? Hey, this is Michael from Yes And. My yeah, Michael from what? Yeah, oh, yes, who? And it's, it was a, it's a nightmare, it still is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what our name is. And for this, you're going to need to move if you're not next to someone. So I want you to find someone that you're close to one person, or you know, if you have to, get into groups of three. If you gotta move, you gotta move. But well, you can do it. Good, yeah, if there's four of you, just split up one and one. If there's three, if there's groups of three, that's fine. You know, let, let, it, let it be, let it be. Now, in this group, in this group, I want you to choose one of you. One of you is gonna be an apple. So go ahead and just choose that. Whichever one of you wants to be the apple, the other person the other person's gonna be a train, like a choo-choo train. If you're, in a group, if you're in a group of three, that last person could just be known as Bob. All right, so we have Bob, Apple, Train. Good, you got it? Good, all right, we're just, I'm just gonna check. I'm checking your work. All right, all apples, raise your hand. Ooh, good, good, good. All right, and uh, trains, raise your hand. Perfect, any Bobs? Ah, good, good, Bob's good. All right, good. So here's how this game is played. The name of the game is Yes And. And you're going to play, it's a storytelling game, and this is how you're gonna play it. Um, if, you are the, if you are the train, you are going to start off, and you are going to tell a story, but you're only gonna tell the first sentence of that story. It could be true, like, yesterday I woke up and went to rehearsal all day, or, it could be something that is false. It could be, you know, uh, magical or something that you come up with in your, you know, in your mind. Yesterday, you know, Bob went to the grocery store and bought uh, an alien-sized snack or whatever. You know, you can come up with whatever it is, choo-choo trains. So you're going to start off with just that sentence. And then you're going to go ahead and pause. And apples, you are going to respond with yes and and then you're gonna add on to that story. So for example, if yesterday I woke up and I came to rehearsal all day, Apples would say yes, and by the end of the day, you were really, really tired, <laughs> right? And that's what's gonna happen. And then Apples are gonna stop, and then if there's Bobs, you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna go. But if you don't have a Bob, you're gonna go back to Apples, right? And you're gonna keep going, and then Apples would respond, or and then Trains would respond, yes, and, and you would add on to that. Does that make sense? So in this game, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna start you off and then I'm gonna have to stop you because there's no the ending, right? Because there's only yes ending. So you're gonna keep going and I'll, I'll tell you to stop in a second, all right? Good, does this make sense? If, even if it doesn't, just go with it. Trust me, it'll be great. All right, so who did I say started? I always, I always lose track of that part. All right, trains. Trains, you're gonna start telling a story and go. Man. 
See, yeah, can I just grab it? I don't know what I was thinking. Thank you. Good, and you should wind that up. Wind it up wherever you are, wherever you are. The, the, uh, the laughter, the, you, know, the, uh, you know, how it like kind of bubbled, the energy of the room, it, it just kind of, yeah, went there, which is great. It kind of makes me feel like you guys should just play this for the next like 20 minutes and I'll like sit down. Um, I want, I want some, who's, who's brave enough to tell us a little bit about where their story went? Where did, where did your story go? Yes, sir, you in the back. Okay. Okay, your friend got hurt. And you ended, that's right. That's, that's, exact, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. You start with your friend getting hurt and you end with unicorns. Absolutely true. Does any, anyone else have, uh, I saw another hand, I think, over here. Yeah. So our story happened to take place where we were dancing. Okay. Of course. And our two favorite colors, were, which was neon green and pink. And so we decided that since they had our two favorite colors, dance was going to be the root of our lives. Because, because of a Band-Aid, you decided dance was going to be it. Wow, all right. That's it. That's great. Anyone else? I don't want to cut anyone off. Yes, back in the back. Glasses that had legs? Yeah. All right. Okay. Of course. That's right. That's it. I mean, because if, if your glasses had feet, you know, they would just be kicking you in the eyes. All of that's, I mean, it just makes sense, you know, in a, in, a, in a certain sort of way. What I hope that you can see is that we, I could never have stood up here and conceived or developed a story like the one you just told, whether it was one of the ones that we heard or whether it was the one that you were telling with, uh, with your folks in your group. There's no way that we could have come up with that. I've never even thought about glasses having feet. Never in my life. And right now that came out of this group. I'm sure that more than a few of you surprised even yourselves where you let the story be led. Right? Like you started something and you think, oh, this is where it's going, you know? By now we've been told, you know, we're adults and we need to make all these decisions and we need to have the story told. We need to know the beginning, the middle, and the end. But how much more rich is it when we can add what we have to what's going on and allow other people to influence and to change what we were thinking. And if you can imagine that, imagine what it does for a child when caring adults say yes and to them. Sir Ken Robinson, the education reformer and lecturer, he had a TED talk on creativity. And in this talk, he told the story of a little girl who was in a drawing lesson, and she was six. She was in the back drawing, and the teacher said this little girl, she hardly ever paid attention, but in this drawing lesson, she did. And the teacher was fascinated. She, she went over to her, and she said, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl said, they will in a minute. <laughs> Sometimes I feel selfish, so selfish for being in this profession. Imagine being able to sit and learn at the feet of such wisdom. When we first started doing theater camps, like Mark said in my introduction, here at Eastern University, we brought together kids from our neighborhood in Kensington, 
kids from Barry School in West Philadelphia, kids from the main line for four weeks of creative play and imaginative storytelling. You can imagine, I'm sure, the craziness brought on by 30 middle schoolers once they got to know each other. One year there were two Laurens. They were the two, the two Laurens. One was from Wayne, right out here. She was blonde, she just turned 12. The other was from the neighborhood around the Barry School in West Philly, and she also just turned 12. They both were exactly the same height, had birthdays literally weeks apart, and both, at first blush, seemed pretty shy. You can imagine it only took a matter of days before the two of them found each other and decided that they were sisters for life. And it lasted three weeks. <laughs> and honestly, I'm so tired of adults, as adults telling kids that just because they're kids, they can't possibly have these deep feelings of connection. Wouldn't the world be better if we made friendships like those two Laurens, not worrying if they're going to last beyond three weeks, but giving ourselves into the depth of what they are? Our high school shadow company is our fastest growing and most intensive artistic experiences we offer. It's also the most diverse, attracting kids from all over the city. One of the greatest things about the Shadow Company is that they're led by a core of four or five teens who make the artistic and the logistic decisions for the whole company. For the past two years, they've performed to sold out shows, standing room only audiences, uh, and at, the, at, at the Philadelphia Fringe Festival. A few years ago, their show Flash got front page coverage in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it's because they were exploring the history of flash mobs and how it was being used in a negative action by some Philadelphia teens. They created a flash mob performance. Uh, it was an art piece that they did, and they showed it on South Street in front of the anarchist bookstore. <laughs> this year, when we were thinking about what to perform, about what themes we wanted to explore through our art, it was just as our national conversation was turning to the tragic event in Florida. This group of 12 and sometimes as many as 20 kids wanted to reflect on the still lingering effects of racism on today's society. Our result was a show that we called Bullseye. It was a careful examination of stereotypes and discrimination wrapped up in a fun and zany game show style theater. We told off-color jokes. We said out loud those words that we're not supposed to say in polite company. We heard the audience laugh at our inappropriate remarks, and later we heard them reflect. Things were brought up, people were stirred and talking. I want to invite some of that cast of Bullseye to come down and stand before you right here, and uh, I would like for them to read the poem that both begins and ends the show Bullseye. The show, uh, this poem is called How Do You See Me, and Wherever. You, you, guys, you guys figure it out. You guys are in charge. They will take, they'll take the stage, just in case anyone's wondering. They'll take the stage. Good. So um, we have uh, Kirsten, we have Thomas, we have Julia, we have Rolando, Dimitri, and Micah. And they are going to be reading from their fantastically well received play, Bullseye. Yeah, step forward just a little bit into your light, please. How do you see me? Looks so young. What a teenage boozer. Must not know what hatred feels like. The loud and ghetto girl. Rough and tough. Plays basketball. What, what do, do you see? see? Here to cut my lawn, clean my house, take care of my kids. Not an American. Sucks at basketball because you're white. Must be from Fishtown. A teen must do drugs and not care about the world. Can't dance. How, How do you see me? Must live a privileged life. It's smart. I want to think of doing my homework. A math wizard. A science genius. Must be good at video games. Looks like a kid. Why are you playing football? You're a girl. What, what do, do you see? see? Life is perfect. Is so rich. Eyes that aren't like yours. Must love tacos. Has long hair. Are they mixed? Must speak with an accent. How, How do, do you see, see me? Probably loud and ghetto. Must be adopted. Not a virgin. Such an Oreo. Why in this neighborhood? Can't lift it, because they're a girl. 
What, what do, do you, you see? see? That stupid kid over there. The homo. Must be a nerd with those glasses. Act so old. What, what are, are you? A hillbilly? Has good grades? Obviously a friendless loser. What a good kid. How, How do, do you, you see, see me? me? How do you see me? Look so young. The loud and ghetto girl. What do you see? That stupid kid. Must be adopted. The homo. Such an Oreo. How, How do you see, see me? me? Thanks, guys. It's great. They're going to upstage me. I have to wait for them to exit. Get off the stage. One of the things that we found as we were doing Bullseye and, and doing the research and, um, and, and going through that process is that we learned that one of the things that we've lost in this age is that we've lost the ability to speak to one another. I would say that we're really good at yelling at people. We're really good at explaining our own ideals and ideas until the other person gets it. I mean, have you ever read the comment section on any popular website? We feel superior when we are with those who are like us, but we've lost the art of seeing and speaking to others, especially those who disagree with us as human beings. The theater, us, us as artists, and actors. We exist to hold a mirror up to society. We are innovators, we are imaginators, we are raconteurs, we are modern minstrels, we are clowns who tell the truth. The tragedy of Trayvon Martin is that a young man lost his life for the crime of walking around a neighborhood, looking different than the status quo. I wasn't there, but I wonder how Zimmerman approached Trayvon initially. Again, I'm speculating. But if Zimmerman had approached out of kindness, out of curiosity, out of a, a necessity to see this person as a human being, would he not have figured out what he needed to know without escalating the situation to one where a young man lost his life? The arts teach us. They teach us to see the world through different lenses. The world turns from a world of suspicion to one of acceptance. The other day, it was right before uh, the Christmas holidays, I was able to attend the final performance of the year uh, at one of our after-school programs that we do uh, with The Simple Way. The dozen or so kids that are in the, uh, in the program had written a play together, and they were excited to show it to an audience of friends and strangers. In this neighborhood, many kids read well below the grade level. In this particular showing, the cast needed to read their lines because they just hadn't had enough practice to learn them all. In fact, there were a couple of kids that were attending after school for the first time that day. And so we were like, grab a script, get in the play. The play itself was an imaginative jaunt wherein a mother and her child were inexplicably chased by polar bears after being evicted from a mansion they were illegally squatting in, playing video games and eating Cheetos all day. Trust me, it made no more sense than that. The most powerful moment of the entire show wasn't when the greedy landowner let the family stay in the mansion. It was when one of the little girls struggled to read her lines. I mean, she was sounding out letters, putting them together, forming words. She was showcasing her struggle with an entire audience that had more than a few strangers to her. To me, this is the type of community that we create because as she slowly made her way through her lines, not one person interrupted her. Not one child tried to cut her off. This was her part of the story. And she was so proud and so brave and so determined to tell that story. She let go of all of her embarrassment. This was her moment, and it was amazing. Artists recognize their part in the community. We hold the important things dear. In 2004, a group of young people, film artists actually, they started a movement that would be go, they, uh, go on to become known as the Invisible Children. You guys have heard of Invisible Children, right? Within a few years, they bridled the power of the internet and they made a movie called Coney 2012, which was one of the most watched viral videos in history 
and it was 30 minutes long, so much for the short attention span of the millennial generation. But these young people did not set out to change the world from a movie studio lot. They were moved to compassion by an actual encounter with child soldiers in the Sudan. I'm not suggesting that technology is somehow inherently evil. I'm merely suggesting that for real and lasting change to happen, you need to be impacted firsthand. That is by real people in real situations doing real stuff. A few years ago, we went into a summer pr uh, camp program for elementary school aged kids with the theme of environmentalism. You know, recycle, all that good stuff. We found that the most, uh, the most amazing thing is that Kids these days, thanks to, uh, thanks to what's going on in education, they have already been taught about the, uh, the dangers of polluting our planet. You know, these kids were already there. So we were able to dig a little deeper, and we had them write up a list of things that could go wrong, or maybe could go wrong, if we didn't keep cleaning up the planet. Uh, Brooke was combining this with a lesson in rhyming, and some of the lyrics included, landfills, poisonous spills, melting ice, we pay the price. Penguins go to Mexico. Polar bears, eco scares. Big cars, crying stars. Could we please save the trees? As proud as we were to say yes to these great ideas, we were able to take it a step further and create a whole song using those lyrics. If you're smart enough to come and see our clean green machine, and I know you will, You'll recognize these lyrics in the middle of our anthem called Nature Rocks. Wait for it, it's great. So what do I want you to do? Well, my board of directors would want me to implore you to think about a donation of any size so we can continue our work. And while that would be perfectly, perfectly fine if you wish to do so, I'm not asking you to do that. Instead, I want you to begin to see or continue to see your lives as works of art. Join your calling as co-creator with your fellow people. Put on the eyes of a Picasso or a Da Vinci, a Mozart, a Baryshnikov, or a Michael Stipe, or dare I say the eyes of God, in order to see the world and your place in it. But do not do this alone. It might take two to tango, but everyone is needed in a conga line. And what we're going to do right now is we are going to make an orchestra right here in our seats, right? So this, this is great, actually. We have four sections, section one, section two, section three, and section four. Does that make sense, right? So this one just cut in half? Good, awesome. So we're going to make an orchestra. And this orchestra is not going to sound like anything you've ever heard before, so let go of any of your, uh, your inhibitions about that. When I point to your section, what I need you to do is I need you to make a sound using your body. You can do a slap, you could do a clap, you could do sounds with your mouth. The only thing that I'm going to ask is that whatever you choose, let it be repeatable, right? So be able to do it over and over again. Does that make sense? Good. And, so then we're, and then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to watch me, and I will be the conductor of our orchestra here. And I might raise up a group. I might bring a group down. I might want to see the mix until we, uh, until we have it, right? We're going we're gonna to lift our, our, our voices in a joyful noise. That's what my dad used to say. So we're going to lift our voices together. All right, we're going to start. So we have section one, section two, section three, section four. Let's start, let's start with section three over here. We're going to start with section three. And so section three, each of you individually, you're just going to create a repeating sound. Ready? And go. Yeah. Good. And keep it up. Good. That's nice. And bring it up just a little bit. So I can just clap and clap a little. There you go. That's a nice sound. Good. Good, and hold on to it. Good, 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 good. Section one, ready? Section one, and go. Good, 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 yeah. Good, and good, and hold that, good. Good, try to remember that, try to remember that. Good, section two. Section two, ready? And go. Nice. Nice. This, is, this group is moving somewhere. It's like got like a yeah. 
Good, awesome. And hold that down. Good. And group four. Go ahead, group four. That one sound would never fly in a program of middle schoolers. <laughs> That's great. Good. Awesome. All right, we're going to try it all together. We're going to try it all together, right? So here we go. Do, 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 do. All right, here we go. And. Very nice. I don't know if you realize that when I had you guys separated into groups, you created your own internal rhythms, right? You had the thing that you were doing, and these, this was happening, and whether it was because someone was louder because they had a whistle, right? Or whether it was because someone had a fart noise, and that's really funny. But you create, you create your own rhythm. But when all four groups we're coming together. Your ear, your soul, your body demanded that you work together and the rhythms came together until really you were doing one single rhythm. It's my metaphor. I'm not going to lie. That's my metaphor. Because what I'm asking you to do, what I'm asking you to do today is to see yourself as artists to see yourself as being the ambassadors for all of us to each other. And I want you to remember that when we're doing this work, this hard work of creating, that it's much less scary when you have this community that's doing it with you. One of my friends, she's here today, I'm not going to point her out because she gets embarrassed, she had two of her uh, young girls come to camp for the first time this past summer. And I'm going to close with, uh, with, with an anecdote that she told me. She reported back to me that uh, after the, the time of the camp had been had completed and the girls went home and they were playing with their friends on the block, she overheard them start to explain a cooperative game that we learned at camp. And that's the way that yes and changes the world. And that's the way that I want you all to change the world as well. I want you to take what you're learning and pass it from one to the other. Thank you very much. And of course, I want to make sure that you know that you are invited either to stay for about uh, 45 minutes and see our winner sort of thing or come back tonight, tomorrow, or Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much.